So our last bill today is House File 4608, the Supplemental Public Safety Omnibus. Chair Mariani, would you like to move um, House File 4608 be recommended for placement on the General Register? That is my motion, Madam Chair. Um, I believe you also have an author's amendment to get the bill in the shape that you'd like to present it. Um, yep. Madam Chair, if it's okay, I'd like to hold off on that for a bit um, and then come back to it. Okay, why don't you proceed? Thank you. Madam Chair, members, um, this is a long bill. Uh, it's an important bill. I'm sure every chair comes up here tells you that, and they're telling the truth. Um, um, I have uh, tons of things to share with you, uh, but I'm afraid that time will allow us to do that fully. Uh, so I'll try to be as brief uh, as, as I can. Um, the bill um, covers a broad um, range of vitally important work uh, to keep uh, Minnesota safe um, and to maintain public safety. It is, uh, as Lee Johnson constantly reminds us, uh, lead in our committee, um, uh, one of the single most important functions of our government uh, at every level. Uh, this bill embraces uh, that, that responsibility. The bill does meet its target. Um, both um, in uh, uh, the immediate years as well as out into our, our tail years. Uh, there is some uh, shifting around of special revenue funds uh, that allow us a little bit more flexibility uh, to make the important investments uh, that we need uh, to make. Uh, it covers public safety, law enforcement, juvie justice, juvenile justice, criminal crime victim support, uh, supervision, probation, emergency management, corrections, labor trafficking, substance abuse, and more. Um, our two major uh, departments are the uh, Department of Corrections, the Department of Public Safety, and then there are a number of boards, like the Sentencing Guidelines Commission, uh, and the Pulse Board, and the Private Detective Board, uh, as well as a number of emergency management uh, uh, boards and entities uh, that we have responsibility for. Um, those of you uh, who know me know that um, my approach to legislating uh, is to combine a good policy with strong uh, funding and to not apologize for those and to really insist that the two need to go together. Um, I'm approached, as all of you are, uh, for requests for all sorts of, of more uh, spending and funding, uh, much of which I agree with. Um, I do not agree in spending uh, state uh, taxpayer dollars without a strong policy frame and without a strong evaluation and accountability frame. I believe that's what makes for best governance. Um, many of you also know I've, I've presented, uh, I lost track, I think I've presented 10 omnibus bills in the 32 years uh, that I've uh, served uh, uh, with you, um, and, um, and of which six um, uh, I was the chief uh, author. Um, Right now, members, we have uh, some important public safety challenges. Um, and I would submit that we keep thinking if we just double down on yes, all we the to, it, to the point where our uh, uh, rep Representative Schumacher, can you mute yourself? <laughs> Sorry about that, Chair. I thought I was getting some help there. <laughs> I'm going to break. Um, I was starting to say that uh, we, we have some public safety uh, challenges and opportunities in our state. And uh, my reflection is that we keep thinking if we just keep doubling down on everything we've done uh, in the past and just do that only uh, in public safety and corrections, then we'll get it right. Um, however, uh, I think we'll get it right and we'll be safer uh, if we uh, honor those things at work, if we learn from them, and if we innovate uh, and do uh, better things. Uh, at the core of this bill is innovation. Um, I don't want us to go to our corners, which often we do when it comes to public safety, um, as our preferred strategy to engage with one another and engage uh, with the public. Uh, I really want us to come out of our corners. I don't think uh, public safety um, is the kind of work, the corrections is the kind of work uh, where there needs to be uh, winners and losers. Uh, there's just no winning and losing when it comes to public safety and corrections. It's just doing the right thing, and the right thing is what's effective, and what's effective is what evidence in front of us tells us 
uh, should be effective. And in that, we should be honoring our current public safety systems, uh, as well as demanding uh, that they do better. We honor our correction systems as well uh, as they do better. And so this bill looks to build capacity uh, uh, for things like law enforcement. Um, uh, and it also looks to build capacity for community-based uh, solutions. It expects those uh, to work really closely with one another. There's room for lots of good ideas, uh, and there are a lot of good ideas. There's room for things like uh, peace officer recruitment funds, uh, which could include retention and bonuses. This bill allows room for that. There's room uh, also for community violence prevention work. This bill provides for that. There's room for a historic appropriation to counties all across Minnesota for community supervision. Uh, and at the same time, there's room for ending the use of fees to pay for those services because the state is stepping up uh, to meet those costs. There's room for new penalties uh, to get uh, uh, tough for um, wrongdoers. Um, and so this bill involves new penalties for labor trafficking and domestic abuse of offenders, and there's room for prison to employment programs so that former offenders can right themselves and give back uh, to their society. This bill asks you to seize the moment in front of us, and I ask you uh, to do that uh, as well. I'm not going to go through all the appropriations, uh, members, but I do want to highlight uh, several for you uh, quickly, if I can get to my page. Doug, got to hit everything all earmarked. Here we go. In public safety, uh, there's a $15 million emergency community safety grants in 2022. That reflects uh, this legislature's desire to do immediate responses to immediate challenges that Minnesotans uh, uh, face. Uh, the work to be funded here ranges from intervention to police recruitment uh, to police uh, community policing. Um, uh, enhancements to more investigators, to mobile crisis teams, to juvenile dimension, uh, uh, interventions. Uh, the bill uh, really smartly targets uh, public safety grants for, it turned out, 80 communities. These are uh, cities, counties, and townships with the highest crime and the highest growth in crime rates. So we did the data uh, crunching uh, on, on, um, on crime uh, incidences um, and trends. And we identified uh, 80 communities where the direction on that is going in the wrong way. It targets then resources uh, directly uh, for those co uh, communities. Uh, but it also says that safety is uh, an entire statewide issue, and so it reserves half of these appropriations for other counties, uh, or rather other local entities uh, as well. Uh, we do that through several pots uh, of funds. Uh, through the Department of Public Safety, mostly through the Office of Justice Programs. There's a local community innovation grants, $55 million in 23, $30 million in the base. Again, members, this is for cities, towns, counties, tribal governments, annual evaluations. In this case, it's for, using, for work uh, to be used on a broad array of issues that can range from co-responders to juvenile detention to mobile crisis teams. There is a local community policing grant, uh, 15 million and 23, 10 million and 24, 10 million and 25. Again, cities, towns, counties, tribal government for law enforcement use to recruit officers, for officer community uh, presence uh, enhancement, for crisis responsive teams, even for non or, or even for law enforcement to hire non. Uh, patrol folks so that they can free up uh, 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 licensed peace officers to be present uh, out, in, out in our communities. There's a local investigation grant, so 15 million and 23, 10 million and 24, 10 million and 25 uh, to, uh, to, for law enforcement uh, to recruit detectives, investigators, uh, peace officers to replace uh, those who will be transferred to that work. Uh, what we know is that uh, our, some of our best detectives, uh, most effective uh, investigators are those who have spent a number of years um, out on, on the street, if you will, uh, interacting. So often there's a movement, uh, but that creates 
uh, in order to clear uh, cases, which is critically important for public safety, but that creates a challenge in a whole, and so these funds could be used uh, for, the, for those purposes. Um, there's a local responder uh, grants program of $10 million into the base. Again, cities, town, uh, towns, counties, uh, and tribal governments. There's a transfer of $10 million to the opiate uh, epidemic uh, uh, fund for, to respond to that ongoing challenge. It's a horrible challenge uh, in our state. Uh, these are uh, focused uh, for greater Minnesota because of the incredibly huge disparate impact that that has on that, those parts of our state um, who face, uh, who have very minimal resources uh, to respond to. Uh, the bill creates, it doesn't just throw money. Uh, I don't believe in that, you shouldn't either. Uh, the state creates a public safety innovation board, uh, the Department of Public Safety to monitor crime trends, review research, inform the legislature, and inform the distribution uh, of these uh, grants uh, to provide us with good evaluation of their effectiveness. We do increase uh, capacity of the Office of Justice Programs because it's a big lift. Uh, that we're asking uh, these uh, good professionals there. There's investments in body camera uh, grants. Uh, this is particularly important for our smaller law enforcement units who are primarily, quite frankly, located outside of the Twin Cities uh, uh, metro area. Uh, there's $9 million in 23 and $4.5 million uh, ongoing. Body camera storage, uh, an idea that came directly uh, from law enforcement, so the state will assume uh, the important responsibility of having that uniform uh, centralized storage uh, base for their uh, data. That's six million and 23 and six million uh, annually. There's use of force uh, training with higher ed uh, um, involvement. Um, part of that was influenced by one of our colleagues in, in, in the uh, committee of representative, Navadi, who's a retired law enforcement uh, person himself. Uh, 2.5 million, 23, 2.5 million uh, annually. There's a number of important uh, Bureau of Criminal Apprehension capacity building uh, to be able to partner and work with uh, our locals to solve um, uh, crimes, to do important forensics work. Uh, 3 million and 23, um, and then 3 million uh, ongoing. Um, that's just one part of the bill, but I won't do the details on the other. I'll just tell you quickly there are important investments in the investments, excuse me, in juvenile justice, focus on prevention grants, intervention grants, and mental health uh, and wellness grants, and those are built into the base uh, as well. There is also important investments in our uh, victim support. Uh, we should never forget those who have been harmed by crime. Um, it's a tough journey for them uh, to get back to be whole. We want them to be whole for all the moral reasons. We want them to be whole for all the important reasons in terms of building strong communities. They've taken a hit uh, in the last year under the former federal uh, White House administration uh, that really uh, uh, dings them uh, for the ability to have long-term capacity uh, to be able to work uh, directly with crime victims. And so we're filling that in and we're, we're making that strong uh, out um, into the out years. Uh, and then finally, members, there's a uh, justice and re uh, reinvestment initiative work. Uh, this is authored by the uh, chair of this committee, uh, uh, Chair Moran. And uh, in a nutshell, it increases for four counties uh, using a grant program, so a new approach uh, um, uh, to replace the uh, current uh, formula that we've fallen behind on, and it is not necessarily informed by effective evidence-based uh, practices. This comes out of your work for having voted uh, to put into place, and this was a bipartisan effort uh, in both bodies, to put into place in our state an important review uh, process guided, facilitated by the Council of State Governments uh, for our county systems and our state um, uh, partners uh, to uh, look at uh, the effectiveness of our funding programs and our uh, practices that we use uh, for that. And so what this bill will do is it, it uh, takes really important aggressive steps to get us to fully fund what will be in essence a new formula. There's 10 million and 23 on top of the current base. Uh, that's 10 million uh, new dollars 
um, for our, our county-based uh, systems, 25 million uh, in 24, and then 38 million in 25 as the full formula uh, moves in. There's still some ongoing important work that needs to inform that, and that's why we're staging it in. There's a big caseload study uh, process that uh, the entire system will be, is embarking on, uh, very similar to what the courts do, so that we have an important, smart way to invest uh, uh, our, our dollars. Everything else in the bill are, is quote unquote small, but really important stuff, like creating the uh, um, missing and murdered uh, black women uh, and girls, similar to what we did with our indigenous uh, um, uh, brothers and sisters um, in the last couple of years. There's a really important, I know it's boring, but it's a really important data management system replacement, uh, big ticket item uh, for a Department of Corrections guided by our Office of Legislative uh, Auditor uh, recommendations recommendation to modernize uh, that system now. Uh, there are some important investments sprinkled throughout, sprinkled as to, to demeaning, uh, distributed uh, throughout, including body armor uh, access for our firefighters uh, and our EMTs. Uh, members, uh, there's so much more uh, to share Mariani. about that, but I'm going to stop there. Yes. And it's probably appropriate at this point to move the chair's um, uh, author's amendment. Your committee has done some awesome work. There's a lot of good um, provisions within the CRBO. Uh, I'm just wondering, because we run up against some time here. Um, Representative Johnson, how much time do you think you would need? I think I can get done in 10 minutes or less. Okay, okay beautiful. Um, so really quickly, just a very high level, can you uh, move your A33 amendment? Madam Chair, I would move the A33 amendment. It has roughly four provisions in it. There's some movement of special revenue funds uh, in correction, or special revenue funds uh, in order to make sure that we make some important steps of funding that armor uh, radio system uh, from our special revenue fund, our telecommunications fund. There's two Department of Corrections requests um, that are technical in nature in terms of making sure that that uh, new movement uh, toward a quote unquote new formula is distributed uh, well, and that we're also uh, making sure we're, uh, that individuals that work uh, from one county system and transfer to the other that they maintain their rights. Uh, there's a GPS tracking uh, device uh, uh, amendment that allows us to um, to have um, that allows our law enforcement to use GPS tracking systems um, for uh, instances of carjacking, um, and then there's the one that gives me the biggest pain, which is it removes the felony murder law um, uh, provisions. Um, I'd love to have an hour with you, but I only have 30 seconds. Uh, there's an great injustice in my in my opinion where we literally have mostly women, mostly women of color in our state who are doing uh, like life sentences for murder uh, convictions um, who didn't kill anyone, uh, who were part of um, a process. It, it, it varies, you know, it could be everything from just having been dragged along, uh, often by uh, a partner, often by an abusive partner, and in some cases where that partner uh, is going to be doing uh, on paper, less time uh, than than the uh, person they dragged into. Uh, there's a big movement across the, the country. Uh, the rest of the world has jettisoned uh, this medieval uh, approach uh, to justice. Uh, it was my hope. Uh, there's bipartisan support for this, uh, both here and in the Senate. It was my hope that we can move aggressively with that uh, this year after studying it for a whole year. Uh, ho however, um, this isn't throwing shade on anyone, I'm just sharing it, you know, um, our uh, key important uh, sectors of our, of our prosecution uh, community just didn't feel comfortable uh, at this point. They want to be able to vet this more. Uh, we're going to hold them to that. Um, and so the amendment uh, strips out that, that assertive um, uh, limitation of that, or in my opinion, archaic law, and puts in, into place a continuation of, of a task force uh, with stronger directives to come back with recommendations uh, for you all uh, in the next uh, year. So, Madam Chair, that's my uh, amendment. Thank I would you. ask for your support. Are there any questions to the amendment? Uh, Representative O'Neill. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Just really quickly, Chair Mariani, um, was the concern with the aiding and abetting <coughs> felony murder, was it the retroactivity and the resentencing that was of concern that we raised in committee? Uh, Chair Mariani. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Representative O'Neill, those are part of the uh, concerns. Thank you. That's all. Okay. Seeing no further questions, the 833 amendment is before us. All those in favor to the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed, aye. say nay. The motion prevails. Okay, I think there was another amendment that you're not going to uh, be offering, Chair Mariani. Is that okay, correct? That's, that's correct, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. So, um, to the bill. Do we have any questions uh, or general comments on the bill? Rep Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Moran. Uh, Chair Mariani, I want to thank you for this uh, interesting bill. Well, you had mentioned earlier it's, uh, we have a bad habit of going to our corners and that you're trying to come out of the corner. I think you're coming from the middle of the ring and going back to your corner for the same stuff that's been pushed for the past previous three years that has been, been rejected by the Senate and by a lot of the law enforcement community that understand public safety. I just going to ask a couple questions and have a couple comments. Um, first, I want to thank you for the body camera grants. Uh, they are important. What we have found out with the body cameras is that 99.9% .9 of the complaints that are filed against peace officers are false. A lot of times when they find out there's uh, video or even audio of the incident, the person making the complaints just goes away. Um, because they know that, uh, or as, once they see it, they realize that the officer did not make any mistakes. So I want to thank you for the uh, body camera grants. But the concern I have on them is, uh, could you just mention briefly a couple of the policy issues that are required to go along with that, that uh, have some that the law enforcement community has some issues with. Yeah. I'm sorry, is there a question? I was uh, just wondering if you could, uh, over the last few years, there's been a push for some uh, body camera policy language requirements um, that have been, uh, law enforcement communities have some issues with some of them, and they you're pushing them again in order to do this grant. I just wondered if you could uh, mention some of the policies that you're pushing that go along in order to get the grants that the departments have to do. Chair uh, uh, Mariani. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Johnson, uh, Madam Chair. The, uh, the big thing has to do with when, um, when we would expect body camera footage to be shared um, in two circumstances. Uh, one, uh, well, in the circumstance of, 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 um, of deadly force, um, uh, but in the situation where family members uh, want to have access uh, to the body uh, camera uh, footage, um, the bill would require that um, in those cases, uh, no later than five days after the incident, uh, that that footage can be shared um, uh, with um, with family members. Um, and uh, however, a chief law enforcement officer uh, can still deny sharing that uh, language, uh, or rather that, that footage with family members um, if there is still important investigative work uh, that they are conducting. Uh, in that instance, uh, they are required to notify family members that they can appeal that decision to district court uh, for review. So there's a careful uh, balancing of the very, quite frankly, uh, incredibly humane uh, desire uh, for someone to, uh, who just lost a loved one to be able to have uh, access uh, to that footage five days, not before, but five days after they've lost that loved one. This follows a emerging practice that's happening across the nation. Um, states is, is uh, different from ours as North Dakota. Uh, passed something like this even 
uh, tougher than this. Uh, there is concern uh, that uh, law enforcement representatives shared with us. We uh, attempt to answer that by creating that five-day window as well as uh, the ability to still hold off uh, and then balance that off with a uh, appeal process. There's also the sharing of that with the general public, uh, 14 days, uh, again, similar circumstances with uh, ability for local law enforcement uh, to uh, say, no, we're, we're still looking into this, can't share it right now, uh, and then the issue can still go then to district court. Uh, members, think about what just happened a few weeks ago, and think about where we all would be right now if we hadn't seen that footage of Amir Locke's killing. I think we see action on the streets. That's not what we want. You know, family members are distraught, they're hurt, but they at least know visually. They don't know everything, but they know visually. The officer uh, and officers involved uh, are not operating in a total vacuum of darkness and smoke. Uh, with folks, you know, horribly perhaps second-guessing what they did, uh, there's something there for them to be able to hang on to. There's a balancing act here that's critically important. I get law enforcement uh, certain voices. Um, it's not all, uh, because in some jurisdictions across the country, they've proactively done this on their own. I get why they may not want to be told uh, to do it. This is a case of leading our friends into good practices and members. Again, it's the state setting expectations. You all, based on human decency, I would argue, based on human rights, based on public safety, when you're about to hand over millions of dollars on an ongoing basis, to help our local law enforcement um, acquire that needed equipment, which Representative Johnson, I think, I don't know about the 99.9% uh, case, I like to see that study, but I do know that uh, body camera footage uh, can be as helpful for law enforcement, because many law enforcement folks are working awfully hard to follow good policies. And so members, it's an incredibly good balance um, law enforcement isn't necessarily banging on our door saying no, 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 but they're not saying yes, yes, yes. For me, as a legislator who's been for a around here a long time, I can tell you, you can't legislate unless you pull your friends in the direction that you need to pull them. And eventually they will conform, they will adapt, and they will continue to do good work. That's what's happening in other jurisdictions, in other uh, states that have passed this kind of language. Uh, in other locals where they've just taken the initiative to do it themselves. Representative Johnson. <clears throat> Chairman, Representative Marianne, I'm going to take a chance at another question, see if we can have an answer a lot shorter. I'll work we, are short, we are short on time because there's, there is a lot of information in this bill and I want to go through it. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, you have some of the grants uh, to hire for law enforcement agency to hire uh, non-licensed personnel to do things. Mm -hmm. I'm looking back in my career and looking at what we have with our licensed personnel and our non-licensed personnel, what they do. I'm just trying to figure out what the non-licensed personnel would be doing that licensed personnel are doing now because they are required, required to do a lot of that because they are licensed. One of the few, few th areas that there is that I've seen, and that is in uh, service of papers in the sheriff's office. The sheriff, the uh, police departments do not generally serve papers, but the uh, sheriff's office is required to in those court papers. And there is a lot. There's a lot of them that are served, but a lot of them are required license officer to serve them. Mm -hmm. But there, there is a few. So I'm just wondering what you're looking at having the unlicensed do that the licensed officers are doing now? Yeah, fair question. Uh, yeah, fair question, Madam Chair. Just, I will be brief. Um, first, I would say trust your locals. Uh, trust your local cities, counties, town, uh, uh, counties, townships, 
um, in tribal governments uh, who are going to be the ones who are applying for these funds, uh, who are going to be applying them, and are going to be working with law enforcement, because law enforcement is consistently named in all of these provisions. I would submit that I don't think law enforcement is going to look to use funds to, to do work that is appropriate professional uh, peace officer work. Um, having said all that, I could tell you my chief uh, told me uh, directly that what's helpful, uh, one of the things that's helpful for him is to be able to free up uh, licensed peace officers who are doing really important data management and filing work, uh, et cetera, that can be done by others in, in his central office so that he can get them out uh, into the communities. I expect that that would be the kind of work uh, that would happen. And again, I would trust our, our local electeds and our local law enforcement officials to make that call. Representative Johnson. Well, uh, Chairman Rand and Representative Mariana, if your department's using law licensed officers to do data entry and filing, I think it's time for a new police chief because that's not their duty. Well, we're going to get a new police chief, although I, I think we have a really fine police chief in uh, Chief uh, Axel. You know, you often do what you got to do. Uh, there, are legal, there are legal requirements, um, and he's got to be able to deploy his people in a way to meet those legal demands. Okay. Representative Johnson. I just have a few more comments on this uh, so-called public safety bill. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm trying to wrap my head around, we have a responsibility that we're falling way behind and not paying our counties the rates that uh, the 50% requirement in statute for a probation system. Um, and now it's going to a grant program where one county can get a lot more than another county or one agency can get more than another agency although they're doing the same work because it's a grant, instead of this is what, looking at their duties and their responsibilities, the amount of work they do, and a, and a formula. Um, that grant, the word grant should not be there because it's our responsibility to do the work and, and to make those payments. Of another concern, and I, I, one thing I liked in the governor's recommendations that's not in this bill, is, uh, let's see, domestic violence and sexual assault intervention programs. The governor requested uh, $12.5 million. There's really nothing in this bill to stop for the intervention of domestic abuse and sexual assault, which is a serious issue. Um, I'm very disappointed in that. I'm disappointed that only a fraction, not, not even 50 percent, or barely 50 percent of uh, Rep Representative Marquardt's bill is in here. Emergency management. Three million dollars for that program is peanuts for what's needed. Yet this bill only has 1.5. Very disappointing because our local emergency management personnel, they do the planning and setting things in place to get things done properly and to make sure things are working right. And to have the equipment and the, and the plans in place and the training that goes along with that, with all the departments, the fire departments, EMS, law enforcement, they're required to do trainings every year that also costs, takes funds. There's many different other different things that are missing. I'm disappointed that the interstate transport reimbursement, which is also a governor's recommendation, along with uh, recommendation that needs to be done. Department of Corrections is no longer, a lot of times, no, not going to go pick up people on their warrants, leaving it up to the local sheriff's office to go pick up the person at, at a county expense even though it's a Department of Corrections warrant, and they're not reimbursed. That's left out of this bill. But I think one of the, another egregious thing, right now, under current law, counties pay 65% of the cost of 
detention of a juvenile. Most counties do not want, only use the juvenile detention system when they have to. Because they don't like using it. They'd prefer not to if they can. But sometimes there's no choice. Right now in Hennepin County, in the city of Minneapolis, they're not doing any detention of juveniles. We're doing most of the armed robberies on their cars, the carjackings. That's right, they're armed robberies. And they're just being let loose again. I have a story of dealing with the juvenile when I was an officer, caught him, caught the juvenile doing a burglary, caught him inside the store, two o'clock in the morning, duffel bag full of a lot of stuff, brought him to the sheriff's office, called mom and dad to come and pick him up. I spent five minutes trying to uh, explain to dad that yes, I have your son. He kept insisting that his son was in bed until I gave his son the phone and to have dad come and please pick me up so they don't have to put me in a detention center. Dad wouldn't believe that, was, that his son was even there, even though he said he was looking at him in his bedroom. We need parents to be parents again, which will help with our juvenile system. But in this bill, it changes it. It takes that 35% that the state pays away, from, diverts it from giving it to the counties to help associate those costs, making the counties pay 100% of the bill and taking that savings and put it in a grant for other things. We have a over close to $10 billion surplus and we're charging counties and forcing counties to, to pay for a grant that the state is doing. <clears throat> counties have set their budgets. This is taking money away from the counties and funding another program that we don't know if it's gonna work or not. Making the counties pay for the grant and telling them what it's gonna be used for. There's so many more things I can talk about. We'll discuss them on the floor of the House. All I can say is that I'm gonna ask my members to vote no on this bill because it's not a public safety bill. It uh, it's, doesn't hold those who commit crime accountable. <clears throat> it just, it doesn't, uh, there's some stuff to help the victims. It does not help law enforcement every time there's something for law enforcement in the form of grants, there's four, five, six other things that can take the money that could be used for law enforcement and public safety and actually gives them to those who have committed the crime, programs for that. The governor had requested over $9 million for BCA for lab, for forensics and analysis to help solve some of these crimes that especially happen in the metro area. The homicides, the shootings, the gunshots. This bill only provides about 18% of that funding request. If we don't get those who are committing the crimes off the street, having the officers to investigate them, having the ability of law enforcement and the, the, the people behind it, the analysts, the lab techs, the officers on the street to actually do the crimes or investigate the crimes, this bill is going to do nothing for public safety. Well, last night, I just happened to be out standing outside and witnessed a pursuit going down Kellogg Avenue. The officer, the officer went two blocks and shut everything down because the car he was trying to pursue went through three stoplights that were red. The officer quit. People, if we don't start doing some policies that can actually turn around and hold those that are committing these crimes and doing these dangerous acts accountable, 
we're going backwards. And unfortunately, this bill, we go backwards. Thank you. All right, uh, Representative Miller. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I actually have a quick question for you. And uh, so I have a, a son with autism. And so he asks every day, so what are we doing today, Tim? And he wants to know the schedule. And when he asks it, I realize that I'm probably on the spectrum sometime as well. <laughs> so uh, the way I, if you could just please oblige me, the way I see it is, is we're going until 1045. And then we have scheduled one o'clock. Is that a hard one o'clock? Are we, because there's other things going on today. I just kind of want to know how I juggle my time. my time. So what does it look like if we if we continue on past this morning? So you, the, uh, Representative Miller, thank you for the question. Um, and if all goes well, uh, we can go a little bit over 1045, at least by 10 minutes. Um, if we find that we are not able to do that, we will recess until um, one o'clock or because we don't know what's going to happen on the floor into the call of the chair. But our hope is that we come back at 1 o'clock. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think we'll probably come back, just so you know. <laughs> um, I've been on public safety since I first got elected, and I think this is... So you have a lot of questions. Well, th there's a lot of money being spent here, Madam Chair, and so I, I, have, a few, I have a few concerns. So. Um, and, and Chair Mariani knows he, we, uh, we work pretty well together and uh, iron sharpens iron. So we're spending $200 million in this fiscal year that we've already appropriated money for, the budget's already passed, and $320 million in the tails. Um, but what's interesting, and that's a lot of money, obviously, that's a lot. But what's interesting to me are the things uh, that are very public safety related that did not get funded. And I'm, I'm looking at the, the spreadsheet here. And under the state fire marshal on line 22, it says bomb squad deficiency. So my question is, it's not a lot of money, it, you know, especially when we're spending $200 million in this fiscal and $320 million in the tails, but we didn't fund the bomb squad deficiency at all. It's a very small amount, and I'm wondering, is there, have they been made whole some other way, Chair Mariani, or is that still outstanding? Chair Mariani. Madam Chair, Representative O'Neill, I don't understand the outstanding part. There was a request uh, for uh, state funds to um, um, augment um, this uh, particular uh, um, work. Uh, just like there were requests for all sorts of other projects, like the forensics work that uh, Representative Johnson just uh, mentioned, where the BCA uh, strives to help locals to be able to clear uh, crimes. Um, it's, it's simply a matter um, for me and for um, um, the members who supported uh, this bill. It, it comes down to a matter of you know, your priorities and what's more important. And we can absolutely um, disagree about that, but um, it's really no more magical than that. Um, I'm sorry, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, okay, well, then the bomb squad's not important. Uh, it is a deficiency request, which is a little bit above most of these general requests. So I would make that point, and it's, it's 150,000 in this fiscal. I don't know how we couldn't find $150,000 to make them whole. It's a deficiency for the state fire marshal. In any case, um, I know Lee Johnson mentioned this, but I'm going to mention it again because we actually have the superintendent here with us, and um, you know I've had the great opportunity to visit the BCA since I first got elected many, many times. And Superintendent Evans has been very gracious and. Um, you know, spent time both here in St. Paul and up in Bemidji. And when we talked at great length, he went into great detail about why he needed 44 new forensic scientists and how important that was to the work that they do. And uh, Lee Johnson had mentioned that. They wanted 9.7 million to do that. Um, but we've only funded them at the level of one, uh, 1.5 million. In my math, that looks like about seven scientists, not 44. Um, and I could be wrong on my math, but I'm, I'm usually pretty close. So 
um, that's of concern. Um, and I, the line below that, line 32, uh, under the BCA, says simulation trailers. So this is use of force. Use of force is something, Chair Mariani, that we have talked about at great length. This is something that we've uh, looked at changing policy and law. And, and here's an opportunity, Chair Mariani, where they wanted $4 million to send simulation trailers around to do use of force training. And again, there's a zero here. So we're not funding that at all. Um, so we're not funding the bomb squad. We're not funding use of force training um, in this very hands-on way in the simulation trailer. I, I don't really, and, you know, and they go all over the state. They, they're a trailer, so the BCA takes them around and they do a very lifelike, realistic use of force training, which our officers absolutely need. So I'm not really sure why we've got a zero for the bomb squad and a zero for the simulation trailers, and we're only adding, at best, seven forensic scientists to solve all these violent, violent crimes. I don't understand that. Um, apparently, as you said about bomb squads, it's just not a priority, or there are other priorities that are higher. Let me go further down the spreadsheet, Chair Mariani, and under the- Representative uh, O'Neill. I want you to hold that. Yes, ma'am. I, I want you to just hold it, because I think we're going to go into recess. I think we probably will. 